Excellent. There are a few commands and framework that are pretty useful for development, uh, especially module development. Uh, one is edit, which allows you to edit the currently active module or any random file. It'll, um, if you edit any libraries, it will reload those. Um, reload lib also does that if you're working in an external editor, for instance. And so we've added something called log, which if you've ever used framework and you've gotten like a stack trace or some sort of error and people tell you, oh, set G log level three and look in the log. Now you can just run this log command and it will display the screen in a terminal pager if it's available. Um, and actually this is real good for copying and pasting to developers so that they know what the heck is going on. Uh, right now, I don't think I have anything in my log. I just cleared it, but um, let me actually do help log. You can see that uh, it tells you the log location, gives you a little tip to set G log level three. Why don't we do that? Um, if you run the log, there's nothing in here, but this is what it looks like when it pages. You can hit Q, it goes back. Um, the nice thing is Uh, I've also made this consistent with edit and reload lib. Um, there's a, a little bit of extra printing when verbose is set. So if you use an exploit, uh, sure, ROS set it to something that's going to fail, obviously. Uh, it's trying to generate payloads. Give it a second. Good. So there's an error. Run log starts at the bottom automatically. That's a little bit of magic, but um, if you go to the top, um, here's everything that's happened in the log since. Nice. And then back at the bottom, here's your stack trace. So you could technically copy and paste this whole thing and uh, drop it into uh, for GitHub ticket or something. And hit Q, drops you back here. Um, yeah, I guess next though, uh, should I demo the other thing? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. I literally just put this up. Here's a Windows VM, Windows 10. Uh, I've been able to all the things for PSExec to work. Um, hey, I'm in PSExec. So I'm gonna demo something called deferred bind, bind, hand bind handler deferred connection. Yes, so previously, actually I don't know if I can, I can't show what it was before, but I can show what it is now. Previously what would happen when you use a bind handler, or bind payload is that it starts first. The handlers always start before the exploit, and bind handlers connect to a target on a, to a payload, so it'll keep trying to connect and connect and connect even before the exploit is run. And if you think about that, why would it connect to the payload before the exploit is even run? It just doesn't make sense. So what we've done is we've deferred it so that the connections happen after the exploit is complete. So let's actually use a bind payload. Oh, no. <laughs> now let's do x64 interpreter bind tcp uh, show options real quick here set smb uh, set our host uh, 192.168.56.101 set this user that uh, yeah. Make password wonderful password so default settings and bind TCP. So let me make sure, okay, verbose is new. So I'm gonna clear my screen and I'm gonna run it. And hopefully, uh, we also added some extra logging. So it'll tell you when connections fail or timeout. Um, actually, this was almost instantaneous because it was a uh, pretty close VM. And so normally you would see starting the TCP, the, the bind handler at the mm -hmm. top, and it wouldn't, you know, it, it, it would keep trying to connect. Now it doesn't try to connect until the exploit is finished. Very mm -hmm. nice. And that is all there is to that. Um, it also works. Let me do this real quick. Just a demo. Uh, it'll work with reverse um, all the same. And you can see that it starts a reverse handler at the beginning. 
There you go. Cool. It makes a lot of sense. You know, that fixes a, a, a big false positive problem with Metasploit as well, where oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, if you were targeting a host that wasn't vulnerable, um, but happened to have a service, a random service listening on a particular port, you could accidentally think you got a shell yeah. before the exploit ever ran, or it may not even run, or it might say exploit failed, but you got a session anyway, yeah. which is kind of a lie. So that this fixes that whole problem. Now. That's less of a lie. Yeah. <laughs> Great, I think we have one more. Uh, Jacob, PHP My Admin. Go, 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 go. PHP My Admin, there's a vulnerability um, post authentication. You could upload, well, I, there's two ways you could go about it. You could, uh, after authenticating, make a query. Um, the query gets saved in the session file, so you could include the session file um, through the local file inclusion. Um, so that's one way after you do that, the code will run. Um, on another way for Windows systems, uh, the location of the uh, session cookie isn't um, that guessable depending on how you installed, uh, like your WAM stack or whatever. Uh, so the way I did it on that one was actually create a database, create a table, and then query um, MySQL for the data directory. And then the file uh, location, you could do a data directory query and the name of the file will be the database name is a directory and then the file name or the table name dot frm so you could do it that way uh, so I actually did it on both um, I do not remember if this is can you make the text a little bit bigger oh yeah so I don't remember if I'm targeting Windows or Ubuntu with this one but either way it should work um, I don't want to get there <laughs> yeah we'll find out it worked a little too easily <laughs> Set verbose actually um, uh, put in a lot of great print statements. Maybe I should just kill this one. It tries to drop the database at the end so it cleans up after itself. Uh, doesn't always work because the well we're running the files trying to delete, but um, it, there's this weird behavior where even though it says it failed to drop the database when you close the connection, sometimes it gets deleted anyways. Uh, which is interesting, so I threw an error message in there, which we'll probably see. Um, basically saying, like, it might have dropped uh, or not. So, yeah, system foo. So that was actually Windows. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, set for both, true, and let me see, I think one, two, three. So this should be the Ubuntu host. Oh, Ubuntu yeah. Three. Easy as one, two, three. Yeah, as yeah, easy as one, two, three. There's a lot happening in the background there. Yeah. <laughs> so for authentication, we need the CSERF token. Um, there's a weird issue going on with this where it was uh, HTML encoded, so we had to decode it first um, before throwing it in a request. The token's always ASCII? Like ASCII printable? Uh, so yes, but the way it's input into- has entities in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. interesting. So um, we decoded yeah. Yeah. And then there's a request just to verify we're authenticated, but that gives us new cookies, so we had to pull out even more cookies and the token change and everything. Um, there, were, there were like three, two or three set cookie headers, right? Uh, so this one's Ubuntu, and we had Windows as well, so it works on both. Uses different methods for the local file inclusion. No one is safe. No one is safe, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs>